Wasn't that good? Thank you, ladies, so very much. I don't know if y'all have a name or not, but uh, it sure was a blessing. Well, I know you have a name individually. I didn't know if you have a, a group name or not. Well, thank you so much for coming on this Tuesday night. God's been good today, hasn't he? I hope you've enjoyed his blessing. It's, it's been a nice day. It hadn't been too hot. It hadn't been too cold. It's just been, been okay. And I hope you've enjoyed your part of it. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I want to ask you to, to pray for me in a specific area. I, uh, every year for the last six years, uh, Brother Johnny Hunt, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia, has, has enlisted 50 of his preacher friends to help him write a daily devotional. Now, I'm not pushing it because I've already sold out. Every one of us who puts a week in, we have to agree to buy 500, and so I've already sold mine. But, but uh, we, uh, this year, we'll, it always comes out in October, so this year will be the seventh year we've done it. And uh, all, each of us have a week, so we have to do six uh, devotionals. They give them a Sunday off. But so I, I got my adults, I sat down and I did them in two hours. I mean, it was just as simple as pie. Last year, he also added a children's devotional book, and I opted out of that. I, I decided not to do that one last year. But this year, they kind of coerced me and manipulated me and forced me and threatened me and intimidated me and brutalized me and threatened to give me vinegar's law without sugar. <laughs> and so, uh, so I did, I, I'm doing the children's devotional this year. And I'm telling you, it has just given me fits. And there's only one devotional. It's not six. It's just one. And it's for ages four through eight. And my assignment was... Uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel. And I've thought how, and I have rewritten it eight times since I've been here Saturday. And I thought, how do you communicate to children ages four through eight? First of all, Jacob didn't wrestle with the angel. The angel wrestled with Jacob. Jacob didn't attack the angel. The angel attacked him. And it wasn't just any angel, according to the book of Hosea. It was the angel of the Lord, which is an Old Testament uh, incarnation of Jesus Christ. And how do you communicate all of that to a four-year-old mind? And it's given me, it's been at least five years since I was four. <laughs> and so I, it's due tomorrow. So I've got to finish it tonight and send it on. So, so you just pray that I'll be able to get that out. And. I know, I know what, what it's about. It's just hard to communicate on that age level for me. But so you pray. Will you do that? All right. Now, Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And when his, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet for me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. I believe this is probably the most troublesome passage of Scripture in all of the New Testament. It is a passage that many stumble over and have real difficulty dealing with it. There are some who believe so strongly that 
this is not the real Jesus. They, there are some who believe that, he is a, that this is an imposter pretending to be Jesus. There are some who say, well, I know it's Jesus, but, but I sure wish this were not in the Bible. There are some who say Jesus here is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He's having uh, delusions. One of my best friends is uh, Dr. David Allen, the Dean of Theology at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. Dr. Allen and I were talking. I had preached this sermon with him along with him in a Bible conference back in January. And he said, he said, Bob, I never heard a sermon on that text. And he said, you know, when I was in the seminary, when I was a student, he said, I had a professor and he was speaking to the class and he was talking about this passage of scripture. And that seminary professor said, now, Jesus does not sin in these verses, but he is making a terrible mistake. Isn't that amazing? It seems to be so out of character for Jesus because it it, it seems as though Jesus is absolutely uncaring about this woman. He seems to be hard and calloused and insensitive to the needs of her heart. And so there are some who say this is not him or he is making a mistake or he's suffering delusions on the verge of a nervous breakdown. But all of that's just nonsense. It is Jesus. He's not having a nervous breakdown. He's absolutely in charge and he does what he does knowing what he's doing. So how do we deal with this text? Well, really, the key is found there in verse 21. If you'll look back there, the Bible says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were the major cities in the country of Phoenicia. All of the earthly ministry of Jesus, every bit of it, was done in what you and I would call the Holy Land. The Holy Land consisted of four entities. There was Judea in the south, and then Samaria, and Galilee in the north, and over on the eastern side was Perea. Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and Perea. That was the Holy Land, and Jesus did not leave the Holy Land during his entire earthly ministry. He he spent his whole ministry inside the Holy Land except this one time. This is the only time in the Bible Jesus ever leaves the Holy Land, and of all places he goes to Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia was, in the Jewish mind, an unclean country. It, was, it would defile you. It, it, if you went into Phoenicia, it was worse than contacting leprosy. It would make you spiritually unclean, morally defiled, and you could never again go back to Jerusalem into the temple area. That's what it meant to go to Phoenicia. And no self-respecting Jew would have ever, ever gone into Phoenicia. Now why did he go? Well, there are some that say that the pressure of the crowds was getting to him and he needed to get away. Now you understand at this particular time in the ministry of Jesus, he was the most popular and best known person on the planet. He really had become something of a superstar. Everybody wanted to hear him. Everybody wanted to see him. I mean, he couldn't go anywhere without great throngs and multitudes coming. And that word multitudes goes into the thousands and the thousands and the thousands. 
On one occasion, Jesus fed 5,000 men plus their wives, plus their kids. There may have been as many as 25 to 40,000 people there. And everywhere Jesus went, here came these massive crowds. And, and, and I, I, I'm sure that the stress and the strain of the crowd was very difficult. Others say, no, the reason Jesus goes into Phoenicia is because the hostility of the Pharisees had reached an all-time high. And everywhere he went, these religious leaders came and they were trying to embarrass him. They were trying to discredit him. They were trying to persecute him. They were trying to torment him. They were even trying to put him to death. And so he goes into Phoenicia because he knows none of those religious leaders, those Pharisees, none of them would have dared set foot in Phoenicia. And so some say he went there to get away from the hostility of those religious leaders. But again, that's just all bunk, okay? Everything I've said up to this point is bunk. There are two reasons why Jesus went to Phoenicia. Number one, there was a lesson he needed to teach his disciples. And we're going to see that in just a moment. They desperately needed to learn. There were scribes and Pharisees everywhere. I mean, they were all over the Holy Land. But if you were a scribe or a Pharisee from Jerusalem, oh, oh, you were somebody. If you were a scribe or a Pharisee from Jerusalem, you were one of the big boys. All the other scribes and Pharisees envied those scribes and Pharisees that were in Jerusalem because their word was sound. Their, their findings were final. And these guys had great authority and power. I mean, they were somebodies. And if you didn't believe they were somebody. All you had to do was to ask them and they'd tell you how big a somebody they were. And so these scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, they come to Jesus and they bring a charge against him and his disciples. And that charge is found in verse 2. He says, they say, why do your disciples transgress or sin against the tradition of the elders? Oh my. That was a serious charge. Jesus, we've been observing and we've recognized that you and your disciples sin against the tradition of the elders. Now what was the tradition of the elders? Well, it had a lot of little silly rules like ceremonially washing the hands and all that stuff. But basically there were three dogmas taught in the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders taught three primary things. Number one, the tradition of the elders said God only cares about Jews. God has no love, God has no affection, God has no concern, God cares nothing about anybody else in the entire world. God only is concerned and is affectionate toward Jews. The second primary teaching in the tradition of the elders was this. When the Messiah comes, he's only coming for the blessing and the benefit of Jews. When he comes, he will have nothing to do with the rest of the world. As a matter of fact, he's going to put the rest of the world down. He's going to destroy most of the rest of the world. When the Messiah comes, he's only coming for the blessing and the benefit of Jews. The third major teaching in the tradition of the elders was this. Only Jews are the children of God. And everybody else on the face of the earth, everybody else is a dog. And it wasn't a dog with pedigrees. That's not what this word dog means. It wasn't a dog with papers. It was one of those old cur mangy dogs that roamed the streets looking for garbage to eat. So that's what the tradition of the elders taught. 
God only cares about Jews. When the Messiah comes, he's only coming for the benefit and the blessing of Jews. And only Jews are the children of God. Everybody else is a dog. Now, what do you suppose Jesus is going to say in response to that charge? How do you think he's going to act? What's he going to do? What's he going to say? Do you think he's going to look at those religious leaders, those Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem? Do you think he's going to look at them and say, Oh, my soul, man, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I didn't intend to do that. My disciples didn't intend to do that. You see, we've just had so many people, and they've been pushing and shoving, and we just kind of lose our concentration from time to time. And, and I want you men to know I apologize, and we're going to stop doing that. We're going we're gonna to behave and settle down. Now, do you you believe that's what Jesus is going to do? Look in verse 7. Jesus said, you hypocrite. Now you understand Jesus never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Amen. He said, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, The people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, and teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Jesus said, You men are fakes, you're frogs, you're liars, you're hypocrites. You pretend to know God, and you wouldn't recognize Him in a phone booth. You are hypocrites. Isaiah wrote about you 700 years before I was even born. And he said, you have kicked out the word of God and you have substituted for God's word your own commandments. Now I'm telling you, that's pretty rough. You hypocrite. And I mean Jesus looked at those religious leaders and they had on their robes and their turbans and all their regalia and I mean, he was ripping off the flesh and pouring in the salt. Now, while Jesus was doing that, his disciples were standing over here observing that. I mean, he was going at those religious leaders and he was setting them up and knocking them down. I mean, he was ripping them to shreds. Now you would think, man, his disciples would be over here saying, Atta boy, Jesus! Atta boy, Jesus! Woo! Get him! Get him! Sick him, Lord! That's what you expect. Look in verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended? by what you said. Jesus, do you have any idea what you've done? Jesus, don't you know how important those men are? Jesus, don't you know those men can open doors for us? Jesus, you made them mad. Jesus, you offended them. Do you know what you've done? Now what do you suppose Jesus is going to do? You think he's going to look at his disciples and say, well, fellas, I tell you, I don't know what happened. One of them had his turban tilted just a little bit, and it just kind of ticked me off, and for no reason at all, I just waded into them and just chewed them out and spit them out. And, and uh, man, I, I, man, I tell you what, I'm going to go to those guys, and I'm going to apologize. I'm going to eat crow, and I'm going I'm to make it right. We, we, we're going we're gonna to be okay. If those guys, are, they'll be with us. They'll, they'll, you think that's what Jesus is going to do? You're learning, aren't you? Look there in verse 14. Jesus said, let them alone. You see, Jesus knew what he did. He knew what he said. And he said what he meant to say. And he said it the way he meant to say it. He knew he was being rough. He knew he was being harsh. He knew he was ripping off the flesh and pouring in the salt. He knew he was doing that. And he intended to do that. He said, let them alone. He said, they be the blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they're all going in the ditch. Amen. 
And Jesus pondered that. Here came these big shots from Jerusalem. And they accused me and my disciples of sinning against the tradition of the elders. And I brought a scathing attack on them. And my own disciples, my own disciples, these men who have been with me and heard me preach and seen me perform miracles and watched me raise people from the dead, here come my own disciples to the defense. Not of me, but to these religious big shots. And so Jesus says to those disciples, boys, Pack your bags. We're going on a field trip. You see, there are some things you can't learn in school. There are some things you cannot learn in the Holy Land. So Jesus said, boys, I want you to pack up. We're going on a field trip. And they said, yes, sir, and off they go. And they begin to head north. And they go up and they're coming into Galilee and they keep going in Galilee and they turn northwest and all of a sudden over the next hill there's the border into Phoenicia. No Jew will go into Phoenicia. If you go into Phoenicia you're spiritually unclean. You're morally defiled. You're ruined forever. You're worse than a leper. And you can just hear him talking, great God, do you reckon he knows where he's going? Does he know how close we are to Phoenicia? But he doesn't stop, he just keeps going. You think he's going to stop? You think he's going to turn around? Hey, hey, hey! He just crossed the line. What are we going to do? Well, we've gone everywhere else with him, as we'll go. And so they all go into Phoenicia. Because these disciples must learn a lesson. After they get into Venetia, here comes a woman. I don't know her name, know nothing about her. But I tell you this, next to Jesus, I believe she's the greatest personality in the Bible. Wait a minute, Brother Bob, she's a woman. You better get over that stuff. I think she's the greatest person in the New Testament other than Jesus. Here comes this woman. And the Bible says she is a Canaanite woman. That means she was not a Jew. That means she had nothing in her heart or in her life that could make her claim that she was a descendant of Abraham. She was not a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. She was a woman of Canaan. She was a stranger to the family of God. She was an alien to the promises of God. None of the covenants God ever made in the Old Testament could she claim to have part in because she was a Canaanite woman. But I'll tell you something about this woman. She was a saved woman. I don't know who told her about Jesus. I don't know when she got saved, but I guarantee she was saved. Thank God for those unnamed people who just go out and tell folks about Jesus and nobody ever knows about it. But somebody told her about the Lord Jesus and she got saved. Brother, how do you know that? Because in the verses that I read for you, three times she confessed him to be Lord. Three times. She calls him Lord. And then one time she affirmed him as the Messiah. She said, thou son of David. That is a messianic title. It was not just a title thrown around. It is a title reserved for the Messiah. And so three times she called him Lord. One time she affirmed he was the Messiah. And the Bible says, and she came and worshipped him. The word worship means she went down on her knees and embraced his feet and loved him. So this was a saved woman. In her heart, she already knew the Lord. I don't know if she'd ever seen him or not. Doesn't make any difference. But she knew him. He's the Lord. He's the Messiah. 
He's the only one worthy of my worship. And she comes to him and she says, Lord, have mercy on me. Now, folks, I'm telling you, everywhere else in the New Testament, that's a holy telegram to God. Lord, have mercy on me. And here's why she needed his mercy. She said, I have a little girl. And she said, Jesus, my little girl, she's not like other little girls. Lord, where I live, other little girls, they run in the play. My, my little girl never runs in plays. Other little girls play with dolls and make mud pies. My, my little girl doesn't play with dolls and make mud pies. Other little girls sing songs. My little girl never sings songs. Other little girl goes and spends the night with their friends, but my little girl never spends the night with her. She doesn't have any friends. She said, Lord, my little girl is possessed by a demon. She had the spiritual fortitude to know that her little girl was possessed by a demon. Now, folks, demons are real. You said, now, Brother Bob, you'd have us to believe there were demons behind every bush. <laughs> there are. Now, I do not believe, I'm not one of those preachers who believe that every lost person is demon-possessed. I don't believe that. I don't think the Bible teaches that. But I tell you this, every lost person could become demon-possessed because a lost person has nothing within them to withstand a demon from coming in. If I know anything about demons, none of them ever die. Every demon that has ever roamed the earth is still alive. And those demons are constantly possessing the lives of human beings. And so I don't believe that all lost people are demon possessed, but I believe that any demon at any time could go into any lost person at any time, even children. She said, Lord, I have a little girl and she's demon possessed have mercy and the Bible said and he answered her not a word he did not speak to her he did not look at her he ignored her you see why it's so out of character for him you see why there are some that say he's hard and callous. Here's a woman. She belongs to him. She's saved. She calls him Lord. She affirms he's the Messiah. She worships him. And she says, Lord, have mercy. I have a daughter. That's demon possessed. And he answered her not a word. Why did he do that? Because that's what the tradition of the elders taught. God only cares about Jews. God doesn't care about Canaanite women nor their daughters. God doesn't care about Jews. And his disciples watched him. They'd never seen him act like this before. He answered her not a word. And these disciples, they kind of got encouraged. Everywhere they had been going, this woman had been following them. They said she'd been crying after us. Everywhere we go, she's always there. And so they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, send her away. Send her away. And I guess they thought he would. But he says, I am not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he said, I am not come, but for, he was saying, I am the one that has come. You see, the Messiah of the Old Testament was spoken of as the one that is coming. 
Liberals say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, but the problem with liberals is they never read the Bible. Right here in this verse, Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. And he said, I am come, but I am not come except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he say that? Because that's what the tradition of the elders When the Messiah comes, he's only coming for the blessing and the benefit of the Jews and not Canaanite women. And this woman comes again. And she sends another one of those holy telegrams to heaven. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me. Finally, Jesus speaks to her. He looks at her with disdain and he says, It is not fitting to take the children's bread and give it to a dog like you. Why did he say that? Because that's what the tradition of the elders taught. Only Jews are God's children, and everybody else is a dog. Finally, his disciples get it. Finally, they understand what's going on. He's not having a breakdown. He's not having a mental lapse. He's showing us how low down and pitiful and sorry we were when we came to the defense of those guys who were talking about sinning against the tradition of the elders. He's acting out like we were behaving in our own hearts. He's playing a part. He's acting a role. And that's exactly what he's doing. And folks, I want to tell you, the disciples... They learned this lesson. You can read the rest of this book. This never comes up again. I mean, they learned it, and they learned it well. And they learned it up there in Phoenicia. Now, hey, sometimes we're not any better than they are. Sometimes those of us who are born here in the South, sometimes we think uh, we're, we're better than those who live in other parts of the country, those in the North or the Midwest or the West. We're We Southerners are just the best. We're better than they are. Sometimes those of us who are white, we think we're better than those who are not white. Sometimes those of us who live in America think we're better than people who live in other parts of the world. Now listen, you better get over that or God will have you in Phoenicia quick. So the disciples needed to learn a lesson, and they did. Do you think it's fitting for me to take the food from the children's table and give it to a dog like you? And she said, Lord, it's true. I'm a dog. But even dogs eat the bread, eat the crumbs from the master's table. I'd just like to go in another room and shout a little bit. Oh, my. Then Jesus comes back into character. And he says, oh, woman. Not dog. Woman. Created in the image of God. Great is your faith. What is great faith? Let me tell you, it has nothing to do with how much faith you have. People say to me, Brother Bob, I need more faith. I wish I had more faith. Oh, I wish I had more. You don't need any more faith. Jesus said, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, and you can have a grain of mustard seed in your hand and not even see it. It's so small. But he said, you can have the amount of faith of a grain of mustard seed and and say to this mountain, get up and move over here. Hey, I haven't seen any mountains flopping around in West Tennessee, have you? 
It's not the amount of your faith. It's the object of your faith. When your faith is grounded and rooted and centered in the person of Jesus Christ. That's great faith. Great faith is placed in the right object. But I'll tell you something else about great faith. It is persistent faith. You know why I think this woman is one of the great, is maybe the greatest person in the New Testament besides Jesus? Because she wouldn't give up. Now I have to tell you, I'm not sure I'd have done this. I just have to confess my sin. I'm not sure I'd have done it. I mean, here she is. She loves the Lord. She's been saved. And she has a little girl that's demon-possessed. And she comes to him and says, Lord, have mercy. And he ignores her. Now, that would have discouraged me. And then she comes again and he says, I'm not come for anybody except the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would hurt my feelings. And then she says, Lord, please help me. On her knees, clinging to his feet, Lord, help me. And he said, it is not fitting for me to take the children's bread and give it to a dog like you. Hey, I'm telling you that to seal the deal for me. I'm just being honest. I'd have walked away and said, to heck with him. He's not who I thought he was. I thought he loved people. It doesn't seem to. I thought he cared about people. It doesn't seem to. I thought he answered prayers. It doesn't seem to. I'm telling you, that would have done it for me. But not this woman. No, not this one. I'm telling you, folks, she'd already committed in her heart that Jesus was all she needed. Isn't that what those ladies sang a moment ago? Jesus is all we need. And she was committed to that truth, and she had already given him her heart, and she was not going to leave him for anything. And she said, Lord, you're right, I'm a dog. But even dogs... Neither the crumbs that fall off the master's table. Persistent faith. Faith that doesn't quit. Folks, this is not a what Dr. R.G. Lee used to call a Polly Wanna Cracker kind of prayer. It wasn't God help everybody, God bless everybody, God save everybody, God be with all the missionaries. No, no, no. I'm telling you, this woman had a specific need and she'd come to the only one who could do anything about it and she was gripping and she was not going to give up. And Jesus said, oh, woman, great is your faith. And then he said this, be it unto thee, as thou wilt. You know what that means? Honey, you got what you came for. And the Bible says, from that very hour, her daughter was made whole. Sweetheart, when you get home, oh, when you get home, your little girl's going to be a whole lot different than she was when you left there. When you get home, your little girl's going to be standing in the street running and playing with other little girls. When you get home, your little girl's going to be making mud pies and playing with little dolls. When you get home, your little girl's going to be singing songs and she's going to say, Mama, can I go spend the night with Susie tonight? Because of your great faith, you got what you came for. Faith. Persistence. Don't quit, beloved. Don't quit. I shared with the pastors yesterday morning in their conference out of 1 Corinthians 15, where the apostle said, Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't quit. Don't quit serving the Lord. Don't quit singing. One lady said to me some time ago, and I've known her for 50 years, she said, Brother Bob, I don't sing in the choir anymore. I said, why don't you sing in the choir? She said, well, my voice cracks. I said, I've known you 50 years. It always has cracked. Don't stop. (laughs) Just get back in and crack for Jesus. Amen? (laughs) Don't stop singing. Don't stop preaching. Don't stop praying. Don't stop witnessing. Don't stop crying. Don't stop teaching. Keep at it. 
One lady said to me not long ago, she said, Brother Bob, I'm going to give up my class. I'm not going to teach anymore. Why? Well, I just got those five little old ladies, and that's all I ever have, just those five. And down the hall, there's a teacher, and she's got 40 in her class, and I just got these five little old ladies. I said, listen, lady, those five little old ladies need somebody to tell them about God's Word, and God put you there to do it. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't throw and run up the white flag. Just keep on keeping on. I live in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. A lot of people hear that, ta- that name of that town, Muscle Shoals, and they think I live down on the Gulf. Well, Muscle Shoals is as far away from the Gulf as you can get and still be in Alabama. It's, it's 180 miles from here to my house, and, and it's, uh, it's in the northwest corner of Alabama. If anybody knows anything about Muscle Shoals, they usually know this. It's the hit recording capital of the world. Most of the all-time great singers that you've ever heard of. I'm not talking about gospel singers. I'm talking about all of the famous worldwide best-known singers in America and around the world. Most of them started in the recording industry in Muscle Shoals, Alabama at a place called Fame studios. Fame Studios was originated and owned and still owned by a man by the name of Rick Hall. Rick Hall is the owner of Fame Studios and he's one of the most powerful men in the music business today. Last year in Los Angeles at the Grammy Awards convention they presented him a Grammy for Lifetime Achievement and they don't just give those out like lollipops. He's powerful. He can make you or break you in the music industry. I was pastor at the First Baptist Church of Muscle Shoals from 1977 to 1988. And Rick's wife was a member of our church, Linda, Linda Hall. Wonderful, godly lady. And she was always in church and Rick would come with her. He loved to hear me preach. He was lost as lost can be but he liked to hear me preach. Maybe he liked my animated style. Maybe he liked a little bit of humor that I put in, but he liked to hear me preach. Even when I would go off and preach revival, sometimes he'd just show up and be out there. Big handlebar mustache. Powerful, rich man. About 36 and a half years ago, I went to their home. They have a big palatial home down on a big ranch south of Muscle Shoals, and I went to their home, and for two hours, or maybe three that night, I sat with Rick and talked to him and shared the gospel, and totally uninterested. Rick, wouldn't you like to get saved? No, preacher, I, I don't know. Okay. And I'd witness to him, I'd go by the office, because he liked me. I'd go by his office, and Go back and and talk to him about the Lord. No, preacher, no, no. Well, my wife and I, we moved from Memphis, I mean from Muscle Shoals to Memphis. In 1988, I left there and came to Kirby Woods in Memphis. But my mother and dad, they still lived in Florence, which is right across the river from Muscle Shoals. So when I would go see them, I'd usually go by Fame Studio and go by and see Rick. Rick, you ready to give your heart to the Lord? No, no, preacher. Good to see you. No. Okay, 36 years passed from the first time I witnessed him. Last May, Rick is now 82 years old. He's the man who single-handedly put Muscle Shoals on the map. You can go home tonight and pull up Netflix and go to that documentary movie, Muscle Shoals, and it's his life story. And there aren't any actors in it. It's him. Last May, he called and he said, Brother Bob, would you come to my house and talk to me about my soul? I said, yes, sir. I'm on my way. And I'm telling you, I was there in about 10 minutes, and it takes 15 to get there. (laughs) And I knocked on his door. We went through the big house. We went back on the veranda, the back porch, and for two hours, two solid hours, 
I went through the gospel. I, I, I tried to remember everything Dr. Gray Ellison ever taught me in evangelism class. I approached it from every way I knew. To, and after two hours of sharing the gospel, I said, Ricky, you ready to give your heart to Jesus? He said, no. I said, what? He said, no. I said, wait a minute, Rick. I didn't call you to come out here. You called me to come talk to you about your soul. He said, I know it, but I'm not ready. I said, now, Rick, son, you're 82 years old. You better get ready if you're going to get ready. And he said, I'm not ready. I said, well, Rick, for 36 years I've been sharing Christ with you and praying for you and coming by to see you. If you ever get ready, call me. The following month, June, it was on Saturday before Father's Day this past June. My wife teaches a ladies Sunday school class and all of those ladies were at our house and all of them brought their husbands and we live on the lake in Muscle Shoals and I was giving them all rides on my pontoon boat. Man, I thought I was Captain John, you know. And we, we, were, we were giving them pontoon boat rides and my wife was cooking and we were grilling and, and about one o'clock we were just getting ready to eat and the phone rang. And it was Rick. He said, Brother Bob... I'm ready. I looked at my watch. I said, well, Rick, I tell you, we're just now sitting down to eat. I'll, uh, I'll be there at 4 o'clock. He said, okay. I told the folks who were at our house said, what was going on. And they said, oh, Brother Bob, don't wait. Go now. Go now. I said, no, I've danced this dance before. I'm going to let him simmer a little bit. <laughs> but at 4 o'clock, I was on his front porch. And then we went through the house to the back porch again. And after an hour, I shared the gospel with him for about an hour. And then I said, Rick, are, are you ready to give your heart to the Lord? And he said, I sure am. And so I said, well, let me lead you in a prayer. And I led him in a sinner's prayer, and he prayed everything I said, and he asked God to forgive him of his sins. He promised God he was turning away from sin. And then he asked Jesus to come in his heart and to save him. And I'm telling you, it was wonderful. Then when I got through leading him in a prayer, he looked at me and said, Brother Bob, is it okay if I pray now for myself? I said, yeah, go ahead. And he said, dear God, I want to thank you for saving a man like me today. God, all I ever wanted in my life was to make a lot of money and to be a big shot in the music business. But he said, God, for the rest of my life, I'm going to live for you. I take June off. I don't do revivals in June. And so I was at church. And he and his wife were now She's now a member of uh, the church where my wife and I are members. Our son is our pastor. And on that Sunday, they had, at that time, they had three morning services. We've just moved into a brand new facility, moved, completely relocated. And in that third morning service, on that Sunday of Father's Day last year, my son preached, he gave the invitation, and the first one down the aisle was Rick Hall making his profession of faith in Jesus. My son said, Dad, I know how long you and Rick have been friends, and I know how much you've prayed for him. Would you like to baptize him next Sunday? I said, oh, oh would I? <laughs> and the Sunday after Father's Day last year, in the third service of the morning services at Highland Park Baptist Church in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, I went into the baptistry, and then Rick Hall came down into the baptistry. And I said, Rick, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? He said, oh, I sure have. I sure have. And I baptized him in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. One of his sons lives across the cove from me. He has three sons. And I saw one of his sons the other day, and he said, Brother Bob, he said, the Rick Hall of today is not the dad I grew up with. He is a totally different man. It is the talk 
of Marshall Show. Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? Rick Hall got saved. Now, when you go home, if you pull up Netflix and look at that movie, he wasn't saved. That movie was just done a little over a year ago. He wasn't saved then. So you'll hear a couple of little old words and you'll say, oh, I can't believe that preacher told me to look at that. I'm telling you, he's lost then. And lost people do lost things. But he has a brand new book. The, uh, Dr. Dobson's organization, they sent their, one of their top dogs down here. Got a brand new book. It's just come out this month. Per, uh, destined to be a bestseller. Already selling like hotcakes. It's called From Shame to Fame. Recall, in the last chapter of that book is what I've talked to you about tonight. Folks, I want to tell you, don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give up. Maybe you have a husband. Maybe you have a wife. Maybe you have a son or a daughter. Maybe you have a mother or a dad, and they're lost. And you've prayed for them and you've witnessed to them and you've done your best to love them. And sometimes the devil comes, I'll oh, just forget it. And, so, and sometimes you just say, well, I'm not going to ever say anything about it. He can just go to hell for all I care. Hey, that's not persistent faith. Just don't stop. Keep up. Keep on. Keeping on. Jesus went to Phoenicia. The disciples needed to learn a lesson. And there was a lady there that needed him who would not give up. Folks, stay by the stuff. Keep at it. Would you stand with me, please? I know this is not really like a revival sermon. Maybe it's more like a Bible conference sermon. I don't really know the difference, but but I believe God laid it on my heart to share with you tonight. So I've preached it. And if you're here tonight and maybe you've become a little discouraged. Maybe you even have gotten defeated and you've given up. Something you used to pray about. You don't pray anymore. And someone you used to witness to and you don't witness anymore. A service in the church you used to perform and you're not performing it anymore. Or you're thinking about quitting. During this invitation, why don't you make your way to this altar and say, Dear God, I've come to start over. I've come to start fresh. Lord, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. Lord, if your Holy Spirit will empower me, I'm going to serve you till you call me home to heaven. And tonight, I just want to start over. Now, Lord, I've done my very best. I've preached what you told me to preach. And now this is not my invitation, it's yours. And I pray that people would respond as you lead them. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing our hymn, and as we sing, won't you come?